Good afternoon. Uh, hi. Um, so I almost didn't get here because uh, I flew through London. So I live in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, in the USA. And I flew through London. And some of you may be aware that there was a massive computer outage on Saturday in the United Kingdom. Now, they were doing DevOps. Now they're doing DevOps, which is uh, similar, but a little bit less useful. useful. Uh, just shows you, though, doesn't it? I mean, literally, one server got unplugged. That's the excuse they used. And the entire network collapsed. And um, the one interesting thing is that the new, you know the Airbus 380s? Well, when I was trying to check in, a 380 had just been canceled. It turns out that the infrastructure to deal with 500 people to try to rebook at the same time is not there. It was just crazy, you know. So maybe there's a learning point for about scaling there. Maybe there's something we can take on board. So my name's Dave West. Um, my job is to keep you past, you've all had lots of pasta for lunch, which I hear is a really good thing to give somebody just before thinking in the afternoon. Yeah, great. So we'll see, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I, you know how my definition of done is, is going to be, um, it is going to be the time box, obviously, which is 40 minutes, but also if anybody is still asleep after the time box, that's, uh, then I'll have failed probably, or, or maybe not, I don't know. So I'm going to talk a little bit about scaling. I'm going to talk a little bit about something called the supernova, which is a term that was coined by a guy called Thomas Friedman, the world is flat guy. And uh, he described this changing world that we're living in. And, and I'll try to really paint why scaling needs to, why we need to start thinking about scaling and thinking about agile in a, different, in a different way. Another way to think about it is surviving. I think Dan did a great job this morning highlighting how painful it is in an agile transformation. I, I don't know about you, but I came out of it feeling a little bit disappointed and depressed because, frankly, chain, this world that we have to live in is really, really, cha really challenging. And ultimately, I think the people that we have to persuade to change are not necessarily accepting that change, which is interesting. So scrum.org, just a quick word about scrum.org. Um, uh, I work for Ken Schwaber, uh, which is an interesting experience. I run his organization. And um, we're interestingly not about Scrum. We're about improving the profession of software delivery. And the first thing I want to make sure, if anybody takes one thing around, out of this uh, conversation today, is that it's not about Scrum. It's not about, it's not about um, Nexus. It's not about um, SAFE. Definitely not about SAFE. It's not about less. <laughs> it's really not about SAFE, by the way. Um, it's about actually getting better at delivering working software, right? It's about improving our profession, right? That's why we're here. I do not wear robes. Well, at weekends, but that's a whole other story. I do not wear robes and wander around anointing people with a magic scrum stick. That sounded rude. I didn't mean it to. But you know what I mean? It's not about that. It's about improving our profession. And Ken is really, really interested in the profession of software delivery, not Scrum. I mean, he cares about Scrum as well. And he's using Scrum, and we're using Scrum to improve that profession in a very effective way, I hope. Because um, Patricia mentioned this earlier in the Nexus Zoo, uh, between 12 and 15 million people every day are doing a daily scrum. Actually, about seven people are doing a daily scrum and the rest are doing daily stand-ups for some strange reason. But the, um, tw between 12 and 15 million people, that's incredible. 21 years ago, scrum was invented by Jeff and Ken in response of them trying to build software better to, do, to improve the profession that they were working in. And now 12 to 15 million people are doing it every day. These are some of the numbers over 1.4 million open assessments, well over 100,000. I mean, it's just incredible. The numbers are incredible. Uh, Scrum.org trainers delivered 2,800. They taught 2,800 students last month. And those numbers are only increasing. Scrum is growing, which is ins insane after 21 years that it continues to grow, but it's really, really exciting all over the world. But hang on a minute. Let's put that into context. Why is it growing? Well, I'm not a gambling man, but if you'd have said bet on any of these four things happening last year, I probably wouldn't. 
Some of you may be aware that we have an orange man, no, an, a, a, an interesting gentleman in the White House today called Donus, Tr Donald, Donus Trumpus. No, that sounds like a, <laughs> what the hell did that come from? It sounds like a dinosaur, doesn't it? Anyway, I had a nasty, or, or some sort of disease. I've got a nasty Donus Trumpus. Anyway, um, and yes, Trump, Trump. <laughs> um, it's so easy to get a laugh with him as well. That's the other thing. And Trump does mean gas in England, yes. So, um, so Donald Trump, there's a surprise. Brexit, there's a surprise. I mean, they're trying to tow the island of England away at the moment. There's a couple of guys with a rowboat trying to do that as we speak. But the biggest surprise to me, now I come from a little place called Leicester, or as they say in America, Leicester. Now, some of you may be aware of Leicester. It's like Detroit without the fashion or music. It, <laughs> it, it really is that bad. No, it's fabulous. Um, now, Leicester City was 5,000 to 1. 5,000 to 1 they went to win the Premier League. 5,000 to 1. My dad, throughout his entire working career, put 10 pounds on Leicester City to win either the First Division or the Premier League, depending on what year it was. Always put, and then when he retired, his wife said, uh, my stepmom said, don't do that anymore, it's a waste of money. Yeah, so he's particularly happy that he no longer put that 10 pounds on because he would have won 50 grand, but we'll ignore that. <laughs> and then the Cubs. Now the Cubs, is, uh, so baseball's a bit like cricket, but less fun. And, um, <laughs> and <laughs> a lot, and a lot more, a lot more eating but that's just the American way, really. Sport, it's eating with occasional watching sport. Um, the, uh, now the Cubs, they won the, uh, whatever that thing's called, World Series, I was like, which is played in Canada in the US, the world. So the, um, wow, it's incredible. These things are not predictable, and it's only getting worse. I mean, it's sunny in England. What the heck? Who knew that? It's just insane. 2007. What happened in 2007? A lot of things. A massive economic meltdown. Remember that? The housing crisis. Um, Lehman Brothers disappeared overnight. Too big to fail. We've all seen all of that. But also something else happened in 2007. Something that's maybe in your pocket now. The iPhone was released. It's incredible. Um, uh, interestingly, 2007, Facebook went global started to actually allow people from around the world to start in different languages, etc. YouTube was bought in 2007 for a ridiculous amount of money. 2007, we started to change. Uh, Airbnb actually wasn't created in 2007, but a lot of the things like Airbnb and Uber, the foundations were created in 2007. Amazon started selling other things other than books in 2007. 2007, the world started changing. Now, Dan, Thomas Friedman um, talks about this in the book, Thank You for Being Late, which is a really good book, and I recommend that you read it. There's, there's a few books worth reading at the moment. I think we're at a sort of renaissance in terms of, of ideas. Um, uh, but Thank You for Being Late is a really interesting book. Not that Thomas Friedman is you know, super, super smart. He's a journalist that works for the New York Times, but he's a really good storyteller, and he brings together lots of these threads. And he talks about the age of accelerations, and he describes three things that are making your life more chaotic. Three things that are making it harder for you guys to do what you're doing. And I'm still trying to get this on. This is a bit challenging. I don't know how Madonna does it. She's just so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine she does a lot of things that she's really good at and I'm not, but that's a different thing. Anyway, the, the, so it talks about these three things, the market, digital globalization. The fact is, and, and this is the ironic thing, is that even if I buy a BMW car, or no, sorry, here, a Mercedes car, you're like, oh my God, I've never seen so many, <laughs> sorry, dreadfully sorry, or a Porsche. Notice I say it right and everything. Uh, if you buy one of those motors, it's not made up of just German stuff. There's loads of stuff. Obviously, no electrics from the United Kingdom, but everything else, it has like stuff from all over the world, right? The ultimate, you know, now with 3D printing, that you and this fabrication systems and the global supply chains, is the fact we live in a world which is full of very complex supply chains and globalization. Mother Nature. 
even if you don't believe that the humans created climate change, because how can that happen? Um, <sighs> That the world is changing from in terms of population growth, particularly in Africa today, less so in China, obviously, and, 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 uh, and India, but more so in, in Africa. Uh, we're seeing huge amounts of more people, and people generate all sorts of stuff. You know, they may trump a few times and create all sorts of uh, uh, changes to the, to the environment. And then technology, Moore's law. Now, Moore's law in terms of semi semiconductor technology has reached a sort of top of it possible. You know, there's a lot, it's getting hard harder and harder to put transistors on a, on a sheet of silicon. But the, the nature of the cloud, the nature of network computing models, the fact that you know, the IBM's uh, Watson technology isn't about one computer being really smart. It's about thousands of computers working together to deliver some level of in, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. The bottom line is we've entered something that, that, Dan, uh, that Thomas Friedman talks about, which is called the supernova. There's this massive amount of things all pressing down on us that's allowing us to change rapidly. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you are at the epicenter of this supernova. You're the really heavy thing in the middle. Um, you're, the, you're the thing that's bringing these out. And unfortunately, not everybody gets this. In fact, the social systems that we're creating to support countries, organizations, um, even churches, uh, and uh, nonprofits are, are not changing in this same rapid way. And they're having some serious challenges. The friction that you're seeing is because, because of that. That's what that's what Thomas Friedman says. And he talks about an analogy, a metaphor, and an analogy that we can think about, which is mother nature. And how does that deal with change? Well, the first part is it's not pretty. Things die all the time. The reason why ants have so many little ants, baby ants, is because they get trodden on quite a lot. The fact is that nature is an awful example, but it is an example of responding to an environment of, it's in continuous flux. Focus is incredibly important in nature. Animals do one thing really, really, really well. Um, they also um, don't ignore other opportunities. They take life. They're always, you know, animals outside of zoos are continuously scared. That's what they live, continuously scared. If they don't, they get, they get eaten, which is very disappointing for them. Mutated and test, experimentation. Mother Nature is a great tester. But un un unlike us, when we do something and we deliver something to market, Mother Nature doesn't have somebody going, oh, no, we don't, it's a bit risky. Mother Nature just tries it, and it just dies. Mutation and death are, are linked. Takes advantage of networks, always looking for balance and then looking at short-term opportunities with a long-term uh, focus. Mother Nature is the most adaptive system that we can learn from. But many of the things that Mother Nature highlights are things that we're not comfortable living in. We want to build organizations that last forever. We want to, um, we want to experiment, as long as it doesn't mean we get things wrong. We want to reduce risk. We want to, we want to live in, a, in an environment that doesn't change and that doesn't respond to change. And I think this is manifest in organizations and how that well they're doing with change today. This is, um, this is the S&P 500. And so in the 30s, the average tenure was like 70 years for a company to be on the S&P. Now it's less than 15, and it's getting shorter. And it's not surprising, when you look at organizations, they're not built to respond to change. They're built to be efficient, cost-effective, value-oriented. They're built to be thoughtful. Um, they don't like making decisions, they like systems making decisions. They don't want, they want to spend a great deal of time making the right decision, because that's the most important thing. Getting it right is more important than how long it takes. They're hierarchical. They have responsibility pushed down, accountability pushed up. And they're short term. So the British Airways, there's been a lot of stuff around them about the outage on, on Saturday. And there's been a lot of debate because they have a CEO that comes from a low cost airline um, in, in Spain. The Spanish CEO, what's one of the first things he did? Outsourced IT. He took 700 very high paid, very 
technical, very capable people out of the United Kingdom and replaced it with a service contact contract at TCS. I'm sure that's got nothing to do with the outage. Actually, it might not have anything to do with the outage, but it definitely had something to do with how fast it came up because there was a lot of people on the end of phones going, I'm sorry, I cannot understand what you're saying. And no, we need the system to come up. Can we just reboot it, please? The, the point is that short-term focus can sometimes undermine IT. So it's not surprising that the organizations are, are not able to respond to this environment in an effective way. And it's interesting because ultimately the culture of these organizations, the underlying culture of these organizations, doesn't matter the systems that they have in place, doesn't matter even the people, but the culture, the embodiment of the behaviors in these organizations, the values, the attitudes. The great example is the fact we talk about experimentation all the time, but we don't want to get anything wrong. We talk about self-organization all the time, but we want to keep the teams the way they've been organized, and I want to tell people what they do. We talk about, we talk about ownership and responsibility, but we kind of want groups of people to own it. You know, ultimately, those, those attitudes are prevalent across organizations. And I think that this is a great Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. But I think the more uh, appropriate quote for us is that, Culture eats agile for breakfast, and it really, really does. So Scrum is being practiced between 12 and 15 million people every day. Unfortunately, the majority of those people are practicing Scrum in something that I termed when I was an analyst at Forrester Research called Water Scrum Fall. Yes, they're working in a Scrum team, and they say, oh, yes, we're working in a scrum team. Yes, we're groovy, we're cool, we've got t-shirts. And we do, we play planning poker, usually with cigars. It's brilliant. Um, um, and I say, well, so what about planning? So obviously then that means, allow, how do you do planning? Oh, we plan once a year and it's done by the management. Oh, but we're, but we're doing agile. Okay, let's talk about how many times did you release? Oh, we release twice a year, but we're, but we're still agile. Oh, so water... Scrum, and then fall. They are doing agile software delivery inside the context of a, of a waterfall life cycle, primarily because the organization doesn't really want to change. It can't change. The culture is inhibiting it from change. There's a metaphor that what we see in most organizations is that agile, the adoption of agile, is approached a bit like this, a bit like, let's take this hill. It starts innocently enough. We decide we need to be agile. We look at the SMP numbers. We look at the fact that we want to respond to the environment, and the fact that we never can get requirements right. We learn all this stuff from the market, and we say, we want to be agile. And maybe we even are doing a little bit of agile. So it starts innocently enough. So then some exec says something that everybody in this room loves, because particularly the training and consulting companies, we need everybody to be agile by the end of the year, because, oh, I'm very busy. I'm going to have to up my rights, um, which is always a great thing. So ultimately, most organizations start doing agile enterprise-wise in a non-agile way, right? And maybe this isn't true in, in Germany, but we see... <laughs> Even more so, we will take the hill and we will not stop until it's taken. Everybody will be trained in Agile, even if we have to wheel the training into the room of the lady giving birth. Uh, we will do that because we are German and success is only the option that we have. Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> said like a good Brit. Whereas in England, they'd go, yeah, right, and just sit around. It'd be great. Yeah. But the, um, adopting Agile in a non-Agile way, no, perish the thought. Hang on a minute, isn't the adoption, isn't adopting Agile a complex system? Isn't an organization, we're trying to change these complex adaptive systems and we're going to do it using a waterfall approach? Ooh, might not work. Maybe there's an alternate, maybe we'll talk about that. And interestingly, what we see over and over again is that people don't resist change, they resist being changed. So they'll willingly adopt Agile as long as they don't have to change. 
and models like Scaled Agile Framework definitely play to that because it, they have clear places for you to go in an enterprise agile adoption. Unfortunately, though, maybe it's not going to be as easy as that. Maybe it won't actually help. So when we move from this traditional organization structure where we're trying to be always in motion, where we're trying to maximize efficiency, where we're trying to ensure resource or, 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 uh, utilization, and we move to a mantra where we don't talk about resources anymore, but we talk about people doing stuff that's valuable, and we talk about learning fast, they're going to find it very challenging. This ultimately, I can't tell you whether Agile is more efficient than Waterfall. But what I can tell you is it will generate more value. How it does it? I have no idea. The only people that know are the people in the teams. The only people that really know is a, the, is, are the people doing the process which emerges out of them engaging with the enemy, which is you know, the product, as it were. So, plans. They often want to plan their agile transformation they want military precision on numbers of people trained, numbers of people doing this, teams going to become agile, how many scrum masters, et cetera, et cetera. They march towards the goal of adopting agile with regular milestones, which they measure progress around how many scrum masters, how many people trained, how many projects are agile, how many, how many teams are on JIRA. That never happens. How many teams, <laughs> how many teams are now finding JIRA incredibly bizarre? Yeah. Um, you know, success is determined by we're on a plan. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, well, unfortunately, what we have to do is we have to fundamentally change the way in which we think about organization. We need to move from an organization where the customer was ancillary to the job that we do to where the customer is central to the job that we do. We need to move to teams that are aligned to customers, and that's when you really need agility. So the place to begin, ultimately, is not across the whole enterprise. It's, ag it's against customers. It's about basically building teams that are aligned to customers. And in fact, what we do is we move from a traditional organization to something like this. Now, that's not particularly comfortable for most CEO, CEOs or CIOs. Imagine an organization where actually my job isn't to be the important person. My job is to help everybody else. My job is to support and to serve. The ultimate server in the organization is the COO and the CIO. You know, their, their job is to facilitate and to enable an environment that delivers teams that have a focus on customers, all the things they need to deliver value. So we need to turn the organization upside down because we're trying to, oh, whoa, whoa, that was, no. We're trying to build against this world. And we know how to build against this world. We really do know what works in this, in this environment. And, every, and we, so we need to build organizations to support it. And the thing that works is this. It's called inspection and adaption through transparency. The very foundation of Scrum. This idea that we, work, we understand an opportunity. We understand the desired outcomes. We evaluate possible solutions. We build a part of it. We then deploy a measure. We continuously cycle. We build organizations that do this now. We build organizations that are continuously doing this and inspecting and adapting. We build organizations that are trying to do that. So the place that we start is with the teams. The first job to any scaling is to start building software at the team level. But it's actually a little bit different from that. It's about aligning those teams to customers. Start with the teams aligned to customers. That's the first place to begin. Most organizations are trying to adopt Scrum without any idea who their customers are or the products that they're building. They're just using Scrum to take their existing projects and deliver them in an incremental iterative approach. That's great, that will work, it will help, but it ultimately won't solve the problem. The place you begin is by aligning Scrum, which is a, a great framework practiced by lots of people, to actually customers. So start with Scrum. And then start migrating from the edges, a bit like a pond freezes. A pond doesn't freeze instantly, 
But if you think about those teams, those teams that are aligned to their customers, if you think about where those teams are sitting, try to start those teams slowly migrating towards Agile. So we start at the edges. And then maybe those teams are using shared services across other teams. Maybe those shared services could potentially become Agile. We start from the edges and work our way in. And maybe we never get to the center. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. It doesn't matter. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is to build an organization that supports these teams. So stop thinking about ag agilizing your, own, your existing organization. Think about what sort of organization do we need to build that supports agile teams. Start at the edges and work your way in. Ooh. And maybe my battery's gone. And maybe it hasn't. Okay. Oh, <laughs> did that work? Okay, good. So how does it connect to existing organization? So you've got these teams on the edges, and they're connected via these dependencies to the existing organization. Maybe those dependencies are infrastructure. Maybe they're um, testing services, hopefully not testing services. Maybe they're HR. Maybe they're procurement. These lines are dangerous. Any line that you have between your these agile teams and, those, and, and the traditional organization is it tends to be a problem. So the best way is to make them self-service. The best way is to treat them in, in a SaaS kind of model, to treat them in some sort of decoupled approach. But start thinking about how you can disconnect these, these teams from the edges into the traditional organization. Because ultimately what you're trying to do is provide support for these scrum teams provide support to allow resource sh sharing. Oh dear, that sounds like an awful idea, so don't do it. Protect your team from doing that. Project-based governance, protect your team from that. Cost reduction initiatives, protect your team from that. Process standardization, functional hierarchies, rewards and measures. Make sure that you put in all the things that are appropriate to protect the team from the traditional organization. As soon as you start expecting the team to manage all of these things whilst being agile, it becomes less and less agile. So we're talking about leadership. Perhaps if, if one of the most important concepts of scaling agile is treating agile teams as the most important thing and building organizations around them, then the next most important concept is creating fabulous servant leaders in your organization. Because ultimately, what we're doing around scaling is about people, not about systems and processes and tools. It's about people. By building an environment that supports the agile teams and adding great leaders, you provide an environment that actually is successful. You allow self-organizing. Dan talked a lot about this. Daniel Mezek talked a lot about this um, earlier. And he talked a lot about opting in. But what's interesting is, and he, he, he didn't cite the research of Dan Pink, that everybody is, don't buy the book, just look, watch the TED Talk, that's all you need, really. <laughs> don't quote me on that. Um, buy the book and watch the TED Talk, just don't read the book. That's better. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be dropped from his Christmas card list. Anyway, what motivates people, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. We've all seen these, these things. What's very clear is that organizations that allow self-organization that support it allow massive amount of autonomy. If you then add to it something that I'm talk about, which is the, oh, add to it the appropriate support, communities of practice, and some other things, you start getting mastery. And if you align it to customers, then you get purpose. So ultimately, you need to form these self-organized teams. You need to allow the organization to create it, which is, uh, which is very interesting. And things like open space are a great technology to do that. A uh, great set of techniques to, to, to do that. So then you need to build an environment around these teams, leadership services. So funding, portfolio management, those sort of things need to be provided for the teams so that the appropriate, the appropriate money is available for them to do what they need to do. You need to have engineering services, such as continuous delivery, CI, API management, test automation, the, the, the infrastructure, maybe some sort of SaaS kind of model. You need to have measurement services that allow the analytics and reporting to know the teams are delivering the value. And then maybe there's some shared services like DBA, et cetera, 
that, that are provided. The idea is that you're insulating these agile teams that are focused on customers that are surrounded by servant leadership that have the right services so they can actually start working in an agile way. You protect them. Maybe you want to start adding t teams together. There's a Nexus Zoo that's, uh, that we did this morning, what we did that Patricia and Peter did this morning, uh, this afternoon in uh, a room somewhere else downstairs. Nexus Zoo is running again that talks about how you can get teams of teams to work together without destroying the fundamental tenets of agility. It's kind of an interesting set of ideas, but it's really just Scrum, but it's Scrum scaled for multiple teams. And then how do you start growing the skills? How do you get this mastery? How do you get that to work? Well, you'll see that you should be inspecting and adapting. You should be taking the tenants of Agile and growing it across your organization. Maybe you start building communities of practice or let's call them tribes, or, or, char or whatever you want to call them. I don't care what you call them, but ultimately, start building out communities of practice in your organization so you can start getting mastery inside that organization. How many people are using communities of practice today? That's good. It's a great number. How many communities of practice are a fundamental part of your organization or an add-on? Are they a fundamental part? Do people get rewarded for their contribution? Not you, but everybody else. <laughs> um, it's good. Wouldn't it be great if I was rewarded for my contribution to the community? Wouldn't it be great if I was promoted because I was helping more people? Wouldn't it be great if I was rewarded by my contributions to my internal GitHub repository to show people how to do, I don't know, uh, some sort of inspector pattern or some sort of... Wouldn't it be great if you were trying to grow people, not in a hierarchy, but in a sort of flatter structure where skill becomes important? Whether it be called soft, 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 uh, software craftsman or some other model. Peer coaching, shared knowledge, pairing. Pairing is a, such a valuable thing, but nobody has the time or effort. They can't do it because they're too busy trying to stay motionless or motionful, trying to do work all the time, and they're not actually helping other people to fish. How many people's most important assets, most important developers, never have time to help others because they're too busy and they're always too busy doing their own work? You need to pull out your best developers, your best testers, your best scrum masters, your best product owners, and make them not responsible for the day-to-day, -day, but make them responsible for making everybody else better. And that's what community of practice is all about. You need a product owner community, a developer community, scrum master community. You might need a Rails community, a Groovy community. I don't know what your technology is, but you'll need to start building these strong communities and then enabling them, providing them infrastructure, giving them rewards around that. And how do you know you're one? Unfortunately, unlike Mother Nature, you don't have things just dying out, thing, you know, like the, the dinosaurs. Obviously, they took a, a few hundred million years to die out, and you would argue that some of our organizations are a bit like that. Um, but we need to put in place measures that allow us to know that we're winning. And when organizations, we often, I often talk to a bunch of organizations, and they say, yeah, measurement's really hard. Do you know why it's so hard? Because you haven't even defined your customers and your products. When you have a clear understanding of who your customers are and what your products are, measurement becomes really, really easy. It really does. And it tends to focus on these three dimensions. Today, what, what's the value that we're currently delivering today? You know, whether it be revenue per employee, product cost ratio, et cetera. What's your time to market? How frequently are we delivering value? How much does it effort does it create to actually deliver this value? And what's your cycle time around that? And then your ability to innovate. How much new stuff are people actually using? How much old stuff is there? What level of quality or technical debt have we accrued that's slowing us down in terms of our ability to innovate? If you have a clear understanding of your customer and you align your teams to your customers, then measurement's really, really easy. Now, I'm not saying defining who your customers are and finding out what your products are is easy. That's really, really hard. But as soon as you have that, everything else gets much easier, which is Im important. So what have we talked about? We've talked about the world being in this age of accelerations. 
And ultimately, the successful organizations are ones that are driven by customers and that understand what they're doing in response to that. The idea that those organizations and those teams that then need to be staffed by people ready to change. Dan talked about that this morning, this opt-in kind of model. But as soon as you, they opt in, you need to protect them. What you can't do is let them opt in and then all hell breaks loose. So you need to create an environment that, that actually sustains them, whether that be something called a scrum studio or some other mechanism. But ultimately, you protect them with the right, with the right environment. You then remove the sources of heat and friction from them. So those shared services, those dependencies, you actively focus on removing them or making them so there's some sort of uh, SaaS kind of model so you're not dependent on them. Introduce communities of practice to drive mastery and improve uh, the, the collaboration across the organization. And then ultimately put the right evidence in place so that we know that we're driving to success. It's not that hard, but unfortunately, as my grandma, God rest her soul, says, there's now as stupid as people. And she, what she means is that when you get large groups of people together, they tend to want to over-engineer things. Also, the history, particularly the history of industrialization, makes us want to do it in a certain way. We have to step back. Remember, the most Every example in your organization of when you've seen agility, I would argue, has come from a team. A team that's connected to a customer. A team that's freed from the constraints around them. A team that's protected for whatever reason. Sometimes it's because there's a crisis. Obamacare was a great example. They launched a website and there was a crisis because of it. And they got a small team from 18F that came in, 20, 30 people, and they fixed it. And it works brilliantly, actually, today. So the point is, those, they're not exceptions. That's not, we don't look at what works, and then we want to scale it to an enterprise and look at a completely different model. We take the learning, we build empiricism in, and we start fundamentally from the, custom, from the edges in, start transforming our organization. But ultimately, what we're going to say is the result is transformative, meaning that we're, it's not a transformation, what we're doing is we're taking this learning and we're just making it part of us. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. That's me and my son, George, playing soccer. As you can see, I make him wear a complete Leicester kit. He is the only child in, in Boston that wears a Leicester kit. He's surrounded by people that actually can play football. And, um, and there's my contact details. That's what I wanted to share with you. I think... We're almost coming up to time. Have we got time for one question? Hopefully this has been enjoyable. Hopefully I kept you awake. Thanks, Dave. So I see a lot of awake people. We, I think we have time for a question or two. So is there anything you would like to ask? Right. No. I would not like... Oh, yeah. It, Fuck. Fad can't ask questions. And by the way, my son is just turned four, by the way. He's going to be tall. I'm hoping basketball scholarship. I don't know. <laughs> Dave. Hey, Fad. How, hi. Welcome in Germany. Dave, how many companies worldwide do you know they are really agile? How many? They, how many company, companies, companies you know, they made this transformation or they are become tired? How many? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Yeah. So how many companies really are responding to this environment? Yeah. So what we see is obviously a lot of Silicon Valley companies, a lot of small startups, single product oriented organizations. But most of them, when they start adding more products and adding more people, yeah. have a lot of challenges, particularly around industrial mindset. Probably the best example, so Tesla, great example of an organization that's responding. It is new. Tesla is a new it's company. relatively new, it's a new but company. it's dealing with a it's dealing with an, a, a massive amount of incumbent kind of like history. You know, building cars has been done a few times before. We have Google, obviously, they're doing this with Alphabet. Any uh, are there any organizations, traditional organizations, that are doing this? No, well, I can't think of any. I'll be honest. 
When all so, the companies worldwide well, thanks trying, for bursting my bubble, Pat. <laughs> I really okay. appreciate and, uh, that. This is my problem too, Dave. When all the companies trying to be agile, it is really tough and difficult. Where is the problem? So, is it the problem in our, in our <laughs> is it only the culture? The culture is about the structure and processes and behavior. It is about how we do sell it, how we do it. I don't, I don't know what is the complexity in that all that so, work. So that's the reason why the idea of a studio is such an important one, because I don't believe you can change a whole organization. What I do believe, though, is you can change one product area. I do believe that you can take a product area that has real needs for agility, you can wrap it in an environment that protects it, and make that agile. GE is a great example. GE has done this over and over again. Is GE as an organization agile? God, no. But are there parts of GE, particularly in the medical devices, also jet engines, surprisingly, the energy part of GE? There's aspects that are agile. So I believe that we should use a hack, because I can't change the world but I can change a small group of people in one room. And we can actually do that. And then, over time, I think organizations will change. But you're right, everything's against us. The stock market, short-term oriented. MBA programs who continuously re regurgitate industrial concepts that are outmoded. You know, the social systems have to change. And they're, they're, they're definitely challenged. But what I do know is that you get one, two, five, six, seven agile teams, align them to clear customers, give them an environment for success, and you will be successful. And we see that over and over and over again. <laughs> Hard question, though, thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> well, he's not on my Christmas card that's, list anymore. That's always the problem with Fats' question. <laughs> so, Dave, thanks a lot. I would like to give you my...